Welcome to our service, whether you're members of Second Bal Easton, friends from First Bal Easton, visitors especially those here for the baptism, and those who are watching online. We are glad to have you as part of our worship. It is good to have Connor with us again leading our music. Crash facilities are available during the service for anyone who wishes to make use of them. Activity packs are also available from the vestibule for any children. These may be collected at any time during the service. Uh, the BB Family Barbecue will be held on Friday the 2nd of September from 6pm to 8pm, weather permitting, at the parade manse, otherwise in the church halls. Uh, everyone is welcome. BB restarts Monday the 5th of September at 6.30 to 7.30 for the Anchor Boys, P1 to P4. Uh, Monday the 5th of September, 7.30 to 9.15 for Company Boys, Year 8 to 14. Friday the 9th of September, 7 to 8.30 for Junior Boys, P5 to P7. BB would be glad to welcome additional leaders and helpers. Further information is available on your order of service. Mums and Tots will resume on Thursday the 8th of September. Sunday school will start again next week. All children from nursery school to P6 will meet in the Coulter Hall and all P7 to Year 12 will meet in the Boyd Room. Please spread the word. Anyone who would like to assist with either of these groups should speak to Emma. Next Sunday worship will resume in First Bow East at 11am and in Second at 11.30am. The sympathy of both congregations is extended to family and friends of Mr Bill McConnell of Tildarg who died on Thursday. If you or anyone you know of would like to be included in the prayers for others, or if there's a particular issue to pray for during our services each week, please pass on your request to our minister or your elder. You can also message us using our Facebook page or via the website. Many of our families through the years also who have been in hospital would have benefited from the work on ministry of our chaplaincy team. Sadly, one of our former hospital chaplains team, the Deaconess Michelle Purdy, passed away last week, and we also remember her and all her family and friends as well in prayer today. A moment of silence. Gathered or scattered, on site or online, faithful or faltering, the door is open and God bids us come. For here there is food for body and soul, bread of heaven and wine of salvation, the word heard, prayers offered, and songs of praise. God is our host, and you are all welcome. Let us worship God. Generous God, you give us more than we need, and continue to shower us with gifts throughout our lives. Your Son, Jesus, taught us about your generosity and invites us to be generous also. You give away so much and ask so little of us. You invite us to receive and to give away generously too. We are sorry that sometimes we want to hold on to gifts instead of sharing them. Help us to remember we do not own your gifts. They are ours for a time and we are meant to let them go so that others may enjoy them too. Help us to look for ways to share each day and hold lightly to what we have received, enjoying it all, but ultimately looking for ways to give it away. In Jesus' name, who taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Gospel tells us that Jesus called for the children and said, Let the little children come to me. Do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. He also said, Full authority in heaven and on earth has been committed to me. Go therefore to all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. I will be with you always to the end of time. Then on the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter said, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Then your sins will be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises to you and to your children, and to all who are far away, to everyone whom the Lord our God may call. When Jesus was baptized in the waters of the Jordan, the Spirit of God came upon him. His baptism was completed through his dying and rising again. Our baptism is a sign of dying to sin and rising to new life in Christ. For it is Christ himself who baptized us. By the spirit of Pentecost, he makes us members of his body, the church, and calls each of us to share his ministry in the world. By water and the Holy Spirit, God claims us as his own, washes us from sin, and sets us free from the power of death. In this sacrament, the love of God is offered to each one of us, and though we cannot understand it or explain it, we are called to accept that love with the openness and trust of a child. In baptism, Austin is assured of the love that God has for him, and the sign and seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon him. And so today, Austin Patrick Wallace McWall, son of Patricia and Ross, is presented for holy baptism. I invite the congregation to stand with the family as they make their vows. And I am not lifting you. Good job, Dad is here. Because you'd be lifting me. And to Laurie and Constance, you were smaller the last time you were up here at the font. All right. It is the duty of those who present their children for baptism to profess their faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to promise to bring them up in that faith in the training and discipline of the Lord and in the ways of the Church of God. We make our promises. In presenting this child for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your Creator and Father, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? Will you, by God's help, provide a Christian home and bring this child up in the worship and teaching of the church so that your child may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you, who now receive this child into the fellowship of the church, in Christ's name promise by God's help to so order your congregational life and witness that Austin may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continually surrounded by Christian example and influence. The Lord give us grace faithfully to keep these our promises. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, for your gifts of water and the Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and this water, that Austin, being buried with Christ in baptism, may rise with him to newness of life, and being born anew of water and the Holy Spirit, may remain forever in the number of your faithful children, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Austin, for you Jesus Christ came into the world. For you he lived and showed God's love. For you he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, It is accomplished. For you he triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. For you he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for you, Austin, though you do not know it yet. And so the word of Scripture is fulfilled. We love because God loved us first. Austin Patrick Wallace, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and descend upon you and dwell in your heart forever. And together we sing the blessing.
Austin, you are now received into the fold of Christ's church upon earth, and I commend him to your love and prayers, for he is engaged to be the Lord. Boys and girls, if you're up there, and even all the grown-ups, why don't we just wave to us and say, hi, you're very welcome in church, and you can say hi after church today. Folks, you want to sit, and we're going to sing our baptismal hymn. prayer of confession. Let us pray. Welcoming God, we join together to offer this time of worship, and we are glad to come as we are, each one unique, different, yet each loved by you. We are aware that you meet us here. May we notice your presence all around us, for you are the honored guest, but we are invited to be here to join together in worship, in song, word, and silence. May we remain humble and faithful to you here and now and always. We come to show our love for you and all you have revealed to us in Jesus. We come to hear your word afresh and learn more of you. We come to offer ourselves just as we are and to give our gifts to help build your kingdom. Lord, we also come to confess our faults and failings. You know the poor choices we have made the pride we battle with, the ego that longs to rule our lives. And we ask for forgiveness, Lord, for the mistakes and poor choices of this past week. Help us to receive your freely offered forgiveness and to commit ourselves to making better choices and paying attention to the guidance of your Holy Spirit in our daily lives. Lord, we wish to serve you and to live faithfully in your way. May we draw strength and courage from you as we go about the week to come. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A reading from the book of Hebrews, concluding exhortations. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. 
Marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices God is pleased. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, Jesus at a Pharisee's house. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being very carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the less important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, 
so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Thanks be to God. So do you out in posh restaurants? Is that the place for you? Or does the thought of going somewhere where there's lots of crisp white linen and cutlery of every shape, including stuff that you think the vet might use, sitting beside you, make you quick? Eating dinner can be a minefield. TikTok, which so many of you are all on, no doubt, has millions of people following self-styled etiquette advisors. They're experts in telling you how to sit at a restaurant table or read a menu without looking like a gunch. Dining customs have always got people into a pickle. The practice of using a fork was brought to Western Europe through the marriage from the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine empires. This did not go down well with the church. An excessive delicacy, a vanity, fumed Cardinal Peter Damien at the start of the last millennium, writing his condemnation of those foreigners bringing their effeminate ways into the court, and who the church decided must be so right that they made him a saint. But as usual, most people have the wit to ignore clergy. And the Italians decided that instead of using a long wooden spike that they had been using to eat the noodles, well, they started to call them pasta. They started using a fork. After all, what was another foreign invention when they'd already taken the noodles from China? But in spite of the tacit sexism and racism of those condemning the use of forks, the practice slowly, because a lot of clergy wouldn't give up, but steadily spread across Europe. By the 18th century, that even turned up in Ireland, then caught on in the New World, signaling the total failure of the global church to hold back the onslaught of fork use. You ever been to America? Well, if you go there, it's polite to have the knife in the right hand and the fork is in the left, where you cut your meat and then you put the knife down and then with your other hand you pick up the fork in your right hand to eat. Because if you eat with the way we do, you look vulgar. And supposedly this is how some American spies were captured in World War II because of their use of American style of eating. Over a hundred years ago, the shogun could have you executed for bad manners at the table. Or in China, you should never cross your chopsticks and never clear your plate, or else you're saying your hosts are stingy. And in Brazil, don't wait for the waiter to ask you if you're ready to order. That's considered rude. And alcohol and pork is out when entertaining our Muslim friends. Though guinea pig is fine to eat in Ecuador, but might have the children crying back at home. It's a bit bony, only had it once. But all around the world, belching, smashing plates, and not finishing your food would have you getting a telling off from your parents but they're extremely polite in other countries. Now, boys and girls, don't go home today and say, but mum, Chris says they do it in China. But there is one rule, one rule that unites every country in the world, every race, every class. The biggest rule of them all is who gets to sit down. You use it as a punishment for your children. Leave the table when the kids are acting up and go to your room. But that carries on in school.
Who do you sit with at lunchtime? And adults act the same way in the office or factory or parliament dining rooms. We don't sit with our enemies. Psalm 23 even says that we dine in luxury while we watch them go hungry. And yet Jesus, as usual, has little interest in our dining judgments. In fact, he's no time for table manners. He ate the sort of things he wasn't supposed to. He was called a glutton and a drunkard. And worst of all, he ate with the wrong people. Anne read for us the gospel today. We miss out some of the verses at the start because it's the same as last week. Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. But in the gospel, he's just insulted his hosts who have invited him for dinner by taunting them with a question about healing someone on the Sabbath. And like last week's reading, he throws polite convention to the wind and heals the man. His guests are sitting around him in stony silence, watching him. Having then set the atmosphere, he almost sounds if he's back on their side. The part we read saying, make sure you're humble at the dinner table. Now, this they can get on board with. Back in first century Palestine, which is the same in many countries though, the first century world was shaped by honor and shame, where everyone had their place and should stay in it. And in this kind of society, status was everything. Everyone knew their place, and the way you gained status was through a system of mutual support. You do someone a favor and they do you one back and vice versa. So it now sounds to these good religious people that Jesus is giving them good advice that any parent would give. Because there would be nothing more humiliating than have to have the host ask you to move tables at the wedding. You would look like someone who doesn't know their place and the physical act of walking in front of everybody would shame you, people would talk. Well, okay, Jesus, we agree with you in this. Humility is a great thing. After all, it might help you get ahead. And so they are nodding along only for him to flip things on its head. Jesus then tells them off for doing just that, for paying more attention to getting a reward than hospitality itself. They should not invite to dinner those who already respect them, who are able to reward their hospitality, who could invite them back in return. Jesus says they're to invite the outcast, the poor, the sick, the socially undesirable, and more. He's not winning any friends with the host or his guests. The implication that they are ultimately no more than a bucket of crabs, each vying to get on top of each other, and even using humility to get ahead. Because that's not humility, that's duplicity. Again and again, in Jesus we see a demonstration of God inviting those who neither expect or deserve an invitation, and he expects you to do the same. He expects us, you and me, to stop counting the costs, benefits, and rewards of our actions and live with generosity. A generosity in our welcome, a generosity in our hospitality, which is perhaps also the absolute opposite of what is going through your head now. There is a cost of living crisis. Nobody has enough, which is a remarkable lie, as together we certainly do. But that lie that there isn't enough is only true when we act as if it were when we shut down our generosity and hospitality, when fear makes us stop giving, sharing, serving. Of course there won't be enough if you're no better than a bucket of crabs. But what if there is enough? What if there is enough and more than enough to go around? What difference would it make to your peace of mind and the way we treated others? What if we saw others not as competitors for scarce resources, but as sisters and brothers commissioned by God to distribute and share the riches of God's goodness and grace. Precisely because we do have enough to begin with. Oh, and if you say it's so complex with the economics of the day or this and that, if your definition of the economy doesn't include generosity, 
then it's not a Christian system. I can talk to you about economics another time. But every economic system is a choice. So what does hospitality, what does generosity look like for us? Kimberly read from Hebrews. They are trying to live this out in their own lives. Show hospitality, straight off number one thing, because that's what Jesus did. And what will that look amongst our community today? And we ask the same question. What's it like for us to live with generosity? What's it like to be welcoming? Well known to so many people is Cory Mila. One of the simplest things that Cory Mila has done through all the decades is to get people to sit down together to eat. Not lecture series, not a big program of events, but to encounter one another over soup and a bread roll. And they even have the opportunity to do the washing up together, even though if you've ever been there, most people try to get out of that bit. The simplest thing, sit down and eat together. Nothing fancy. And yet because of their work, the bitterest of enemies, the most divided of groups, have sat down together with no thought of reward. There is nothing in our sectarian culture that rewards those who step outside of their boundaries. And yet in eating together with no thought of of a prize, people are transformed. It shows the bravery of those who sometimes do something so simple as to eat together. What does that generosity look like for us? It means that in these months ahead, we have the courage to give and share that we build community. Maybe we do make choices. An offering to God or yet another digital subscription for a channel you only ever watch one program on, but yet you'll sign yourself up for a monthly direct debit. We support our local food banks, both our congregations, precisely because we know there is enough to share. And by the way, they have an appeal at the moment for shaving foam, razors, because the men don't actually ask for much stuff, but they have a deficit of this and the most expensive item in your cupboards, cooking oil. You know what? I'm pretty sure most of us can get an extra bottle to share. And if you do, bring them here to church next week. First, I don't know what your, I think you have a basket as well. I see a head nodding. So razors, shaving foam, cooking oil are needed, particularly for Ukrainians at this time. Generosity, welcoming one another. You may have heard the Boys Brigade made the news for all the wrong reasons this past week. There's a fight between the Northern Irish region and the UK and Ireland brigade. For all of the debate and the various things that have made the news, what strikes me about one of the complaints from Northern Ireland, that they give too much and don't get enough back, which is an accusation made against the UK-wide organization, is the startling lack of generosity behind that sentiment. You can read about it for yourself. Today you all made a promise, along with Austin's parents, to so order your congregational life and witness that Austin may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continually surrounded by Christian example and influence. What is that going to look like to Austin in the years ahead? What is he going to see? Will he be surrounded by hospitality and generosity? Dinner's nearly ready. Who are you going to eat with today? We worship God with our offering. Let us pray. Generous God, we bring our offerings before you and lay them on your table. We offer them for the work of your kingdom and for the local and global church. May our offerings be acceptable to you, and may they be a symbol of our very selves, which we also offer anew today. Lord, help us to use our time and talents wisely and humbly in service to you. May we find ways to engage with all humanity using what we have. Loving God, in your upside-down kingdom, the last shall be first, 
and there will be endless justice and peace. We wish that kingdom was here and now. We regret that our ancestors did not learn from the humility of Jesus, nor did they build the kingdom upside down as you desired. We too continue to build like them. We live in a world dominated by the rich and the poor are given no place of honor, let alone what they need to survive each day. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come. For the poor to be offered decent pay for their work, for the ability of each one to provide for loved ones, for, fo for homes that can afford the bills. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come. For the rich to realize and see their neighbors in distress and choose to help them instead of eyeing up profit margins. Especially we remember the unfolding disaster in Pakistan and the ongoing tragedy in Ukraine and pray for generosity to support all the aid workers in those regions. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come. For everyone to be invited to the table which has no special seats and where everyone is treated equally. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come. For people who hold power to use it for the good of all rather than for the few and to plan for long-term solutions to climate, immigration and welfare problems. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come. For the day when love wins and humanity lets go of fear and hate to enable all people to dine together in harmony. Lord, help us to continue to work to build your kingdom here and now, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to share the grace that has been shown to us in practical ways, to use our gifts locally and globally in whatever way we can so that your will is done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Go in the name of the one who spoke the world into being. Go in the name of the one who for our sake came to save and to serve. Go in the name of the one who calls us to follow and to show our love in humble acts of service to God and to our neighbor. Go in the name of the one who calls you his friends. And as you do, go knowing that you're blessed beyond your wildest imagining this day and always. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of you, now and always. And all God's people said, Amen.